Thank you. Mr. K. Um, Madam President, uh, the um, submissions concern the relevant time, not comparisons. Uh, the accounts which were disclosed, uh, I have here, uh, took me half an hour to go through, uh, identify uh, how they worked, uh, and to see that there was nothing exceptional that fitted with the prosecution case. Um, on the 23rd of June, these accounts were disclosed to the prosecution. If they were so concerned about matters, they should have gone on that day to have an explanation made to them by various bank officials as to how the banks operated and how the payments in came in and the payments out went out. In fact, the prosecution case is not about payments in and monies received. As you will be well aware, it is about payments out. And the allegations at the pretrial brief in paragraphs 28, 34, 36, and 38 all concern allegations of cash. Millions of shillings that we heard about was what was required to fund the PEV. There is not a single payment that fits that description. So now what do we have? We have another request. Something else needs to be done. And this goes on and on and on. In our submission, fishing expedition was exactly right, a, a, a correct description of what is going on and attempts to construct some sort of argument to show non-cooperation by the government of Kenya when in fact it's the case of the prosecutor that is the need to have relevance and this material to be relevant towards. Uh, that is not the case. You are being asked to give more time on this matter so they can do something that any person of due diligence would have done on the day they received it if it was such an issue of concern. It was not done. Two weeks, they've sat on their hands on the matter and then raised it just as we come into the status conference as being some sort of issue they need clarification upon, how I'm sure they can get access to a forensic accountant other than myself, to explain the detail. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gaynor. Madam President, once again, I note with concern the reference, if I'm not mistaken, in Mr. Gumpert's submission to the consent of the suspect to the provision of the potentially incriminatory evidence. Consent is not required under the Rome Statute. It's not required under the International Crimes Act. It's not required under the Civil Procedure Code of Kenya. Uh, what the statute expressly has in mind is provision of incriminatory evidence without the consent of the suspect. Now, in this case, it's hardly surprising that Mr. Kay, in his examination of uh, the accountants, didn't find anything uh, exceptional. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I, I must say... Thank uh, you very much, Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Kay. Earlier this afternoon, we were told we should be consenting and providing material. Now, now when we do... It's suddenly found against us. <laughs> I, I, Mr. Gay, I don't think that's the intention of Mr. Gaynor. I, I, I think, think his, it is. His, his intention is that the uh, government of Kenya is under obligation to provide materials, even if the, uh, they don't get someone's consent. That is Am I correct? That's precisely correct. Thank you. I think that we shouldn't allow Thank that you. to Mr. lie Attorney on the General. record without explanation. We discussed this at great length with the prosecutor. We explained that there are things under Kenyan law we can give without reference to any other body or authority. We also explained that there are institutions that are autonomous. The Central Bank of Kenya is constitutionally an autonomous body. 
We cannot give them instruction. We also explain that there are many statutes that require that we get a court order. We then agreed jointly, and that's why I think all this commentary inspired by the ignorance of what transpired are not helpful. We then agreed, because we had a timeline, because we wanted to demonstrate good faith, because they had good faith, we should take full faith measures, full faith measures to work together to produce as quickly as possible material that was available without problem. Thank you, uh, Mr. Attorney General. This is exactly the purpose of having this status conference in public session that everyone concerned should have certain kind of uh, information. Uh, the next category is uh, foreign exchange recourse prosecution. It is, Madam Prosecutor. Uh, I'm going to make a point which applies to this as much as it does to the last uh, matter and indeed others, uh, a point made uh, by Mr. Kay uh, suggesting that the uh, prosecution has, I think his words were, sat on its hands. Uh, all of these requests were contained in a much larger and longer request made in April of 2012, which the government of Kenya did not reply to uh, until there were proceedings in open session in this court which effectively required them to. The prosecution has not been sitting on its hands. It's been asking for these things for years. Foreign exchange records. We asked that there should be an identification of transactions by Mr. Kenyatta or those third-party entities at foreign exchange institutions between the same dates. The response by the government of Kenya was, the request cannot be executed without identification of relevant foreign exchange institutions. Uh, we comment, we do not possess such information. Uh, we suggest that there may be a duty on the part of foreign exchange institutions within Kenya to record the conversion of currency from one currency to another and to inform the appropriate authorities. And if that is right, we ask that the appropriate inquiries be made of the holder of those records in the name of Mr. Kenyatta and of the third party company entities to establish whether during the relevant period such exchanges were made. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Attorney General. Except to say, Madam President, that it is this request more than any other that demonstrates the difficulty that the government of the Republic of Kenya has been placed under. It has come to our knowledge that there has been a two-year discussion between the defense and the prosecution about phone records related to Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta. <coughs> that is not disclosed to us at all, at any stage. So what has happened? We are asked by the prosecution to go and find out numbers registered in the name of Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I am, I am, I am, I think I'm very anxious that we should get to that. I, I, I apologize unreservedly uh, uh, to the honorable judges. And uh, let me come back to the question of foreign exchange records. Now, here we have uh, again taken the same view as we took about the, 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 the bank records. Uh, we have great difficulties in uh, understanding who the third parties and other entities would be. Uh, and uh, we are unable to provide an answer in the manner requested by the prosecution. And we have no records. We have, after due diligence, not been able to find any records of what is described here as foreign exchange records. I leave it at that for now. Thank you. Mr. Kay. Uh, this does not pass the test of relevance uh, to these proceedings. Uh, there is not a single part of the evidence to which it relates. It is not material, uh, and it should not be a matter uh, thrust upon the 
the government of Kenya, which is struggling to uh, deal with all these matters uh, in, in the way uh, that it best can. And I can see no relevance at all to the proceedings. Thank you, Mr. Kay. Mr. Gaynor? Simply to briefly observe that the uh, question of relevance should strictly not be uh, for the government. I know there's court jurisprudence uh, to this effect, but certainly under the International Crimes Act, the Attorney General has absolutely no uh, um, mandate to examine the relevance of material. As far as the victims are concerned, anything which the prosecution in good faith believes is relevant to the flows of funds potentially from a suspect which are in any way reasonably related to the commission of a crime, that is material which should be handed over by every state party. Thank you. President, allow me to answer that in one sentence. I have consistently deferred to Mr. K to provide an explanation on relevance on all these questions. I didn't say anything regarding foreign exchange records that goes to relevance. What I said is that to the extent that we were required to make an inquiry, we did and found nothing. My next point was we don't understand what the other corporate entities are. Maybe it would be useful for court officials to supply the documents to counsel for the victims so that we, 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 we avoid uh, a further wastage of time. Thank you. I think uh, we can safely go to uh, the next category, which is telephone records, prosecution. Yes, Madam President. Uh, we requested the government of Kenya to identify and, uh, sorry, to identify numbers ascribed to, used by, or associated with Mr. Kenyatta, and to provide call data records between those same two dates. Uh, in response, we have not yet been provided with any data. Uh, we're informed, and indeed we've kindly been shown a letter written by an official from the Communications Commission of Kenya, as I understand it, the government agency which regulates the telecommunications industry in Kenya. Uh, and that letter states, information in respect of the numbers that were in use at that time, oh, sorry, it asks for, information in respect of the numbers that were in use at that time, he means by Mr. Kenyatta, taking into account that Kenya did not have a comprehensive regime for registering subscribers at the time. So as I understand it, what is being said is that not all phones, there was no comprehensive requirement when you bought a telephone or when you uh, set up a connection with a mobile telephone company for you to give them their name and for them to register it. Uh, the comment we would make is this. There must be records which would enable contract as opposed to pay-as-you-go subscribers, and others, people who pay their bills after they've had the usage, to be billed by those telephone companies. Uh, it would be, obviously, a, a physical necessity that one has uh, a name and a, an address in order to get the person associated with the number to pay the bill. Uh, we observe that there's been, to our knowledge, no court order in Kenya or any other compulsion aimed at obtaining these telephone records. Uh, the CCK, the uh, regulatory body, has expressed hope that the data can be obtained on a consensual basis. Uh, that is to say that we can have the data if Mr. Kenyatta consents to our having it. Uh, we emphasize that it is in order to obtain a full list of relevant numbers as held by the telephone companies under the authority of the CCK that we're making this request in the first place. There is once again an element of circularity here. We say there must be records which show the numbers associated with Mr. Kenyatta. They say, tell us the numbers. We're asking the government to make formal inquiries to obtain and provide comprehensive materials using legal powers of compulsion, if necessary, irrespective of Mr. Kenyatta's consent. Furthermore, we would respectfully suggest that there must be formal and informal lists and records of telephone numbers 
on which Cabinet Ministers and Members of Parliament and their staff could be reached in 2007 and 2008. Mr Kenyatta was one such person and we would respectfully submit that there must be material within the possession of the Government of Kenya which contains numbers which were associated with him. We'd like that material. Thank you very much, Prosecution. Um, the uh, court officer just informed me that the English real-time transcript has stopped working. And uh, IT is now investigating the issue. But uh, I hope we can continue. And uh, unless we have some problem in case, uh, unless we may have some problem in case of reductions, but if we are all be very careful, I don't think we need uh, reductions. And of course, the edited transcript uh, will reflect the whole proceedings, so it should be okay. With this, um, I would like to invite Attorney, Mr. Attorney General to respond now on telephone records. Oh, um, thank you, Madam President. I want to repeat myself by saying it is this request for phone records that best demonstrates the difficulty that the government of Kenya has been placed under. The prosecutor has requested that we search for any numbers that were in use by Mr. Uhuru Kenyatta. The regulator has written back and said, at the time that you have identified, Kenya did not have a comprehensive regime of mobile subscribers. If I am not mistaken, that comprehensive regime is being implemented now. What would, have a, what would a diligent prosecutor intending a logical, lawful outcome have done? He would have said, Having heard that, these are the five or ten numbers that from the evidence we have, and he doesn't need to tell us the, who the witnesses are. We don't want to know. He will say to us, zero, zero, zero number that, and that, and that, and that are numbers of interest to us, which is exactly what CCK is saying. Disclose numbers so we can search numbers. What does the prosecutor say? I will not disclose because it is a question of principle. What then transpires has been happening behind our back. The prosecutor and the defense have been already discussing and gone to the High Court of Kenya and jointly we are doing an investigation about phone records. In our view, therefore, this is not a request made in good faith because if it were made in good faith, that collaboration already taking place would have been disclosed to us. It wasn't. We are therefore unable to assist for the very good, valid legal reasons that have been given there. Thank you. Mr. Kay. Um, Madam President, since July 2013, Prosecution and Defence instructed a joint expert to obtain phone records, cell site data, uh, and we had to go to the High Court of Kenya uh, for an order to get the delivery up of the evidence uh, to the parties. Prosecution have had in their possession the phone data and ability to acquire phone evidence data for as long as they've been investigating the case. They've been able to get data concerning particular numbers since July 2013. We attended together through my lead investigator, Mr. Summers, and a team from the prosecutors with the joint investigator to the phone companies in Kenya and they were told that they could not identify names 
and give names for the provision of numbers, but they could provide records of any numbers that were supplied according to the limitations of the data housing systems that they employ. Uh, I received an inquiry yesterday, and it was quite clear the prosecutor had not been informed by his team of the nature of the meeting that had taken place in July 2013, where they were in possession of information concerning the use of the data bases of the phone companies in Kenya. They have had every opportunity themselves to acquire this evidence. They don't need the government of Kenya. I proved it could be done. They didn't want to be joined as a party to the proceedings. They thought it was better if I did it in my own name. So it was taken in my own name by counsel in Kenya. They have had the opportunity and facility to obtain any of this evidence themselves. They're quite capable of doing it, and they've been involved in consenting to that procedure within Kenya since July 2013. The evidence has produced nothing for them, absolutely nothing. Uh, they were asking for the provision of a number when they'd already got that number and, and provided it to the joint expert to supply the data for that number. Th they'd already extracted that from the evidence. They've analysed mobile phones. They've taken mobile phones from witnesses and had the contents analysed to provide themselves with a database of contact numbers. That evidence has always been available to them. The number they investigated came from one of their witnesses. They've investigated this. Setting this up now as a further issue causes me to repeat in summary what I've said before, that obstacles are being placed in the way of this case and made the fault of the government of Kenya utterly unreasonably and wrongfully. And I hope this bench took the prosecutor to task this morning over what he was asking for and what its relevance was, because for us, we can see what relevance there has been and what the evidence was able to defeat when it was produced. Those are my submissions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. K. Uh, prosecution, do you have anything to say in response to the point made by Mr. K about uh, joint investigation and availability of telephone records? Mr. K is absolutely right that uh, there were investigations conducted through a jointly instructed expert. Uh, however, he's also absolutely beside the point what we are trying to ascertain here is a definitive record of the telephone numbers and the usage of those numbers associated with the defendant, with the accused person, Mr. Kenyatta. We are not satisfied that the material in our possession represents anything like that comprehensive record. We suspect that those records are available in the company's who uh, provide telephone services in Kenya, and that's what we're asking for the help of the Kenyan government on. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gaynor. Thank you, Madam President. Your Honours, if you could imagine for a moment that you did have the requested telephone data, then Your Honours would know exactly where Mr. Kenyatta was during the period of the crimes alleged, and you would know exactly who he was speaking to, and you would also know that information for his close associates. In other words, your honours would have a very clear picture as to what exactly he was up to. The fact that that information is being withheld from your honours is a matter of extremely great concern. The suggestion 
that the telephone numbers have either been erased or no longer exist or have been forgotten, if that suggestion has been made, is thoroughly unpersuasive. And I think this issue, in my, in my submission, Madam President, illustrates perhaps more than any other uh, just what we're up against here, and that is a policy of deliberate obstruction of access to relevant evidence in this case. Thank you. Man, uh, Madam President, Mr. let General. me ask, because we are, you, you are a court of record. Things are being said on the record. We have explained that at the material time in Kenya, there wasn't a comprehensive phone registration system. Mr. Gaynor seems to know more about Kenya than Kenya knows about itself. And we would want him to provide us with these numbers, same challenge we have put to the prosecution. Those numbers that are disclosed by the evidence, give them to us, we will do a search on the numbers. But you cannot tell us to find documents that the regulator says have never existed in Kenya. And that is not obstructionist, that is common sense. Thank you. I suggest that we do not repeat our discussion about obstruction and so on. The uh, final category is intelligence records, prosecution. Yes, Madam President. Uh, the request was for the identification of any information held by the security and intelligence services of Kenya concerning the activities of Mr. Kenyatta and any corporate identities identified under paragraph one, the same thorny problem we have been wrestling with throughout. That's the request. The response was a letter, or uh, we were provided with, and we're grateful for it, a letter dated the 19th of June from the Kenyan National Intelligence Service uh, stating that Mr. Kenyatta was not a target of the NSIS between the 1st of December 2007 and the 28th of February 2008, and that there is therefore no information held by the NIS, that's the National Intelligence Service, on the activities of the accused for this period. Uh, the only comment I make is that we continue to request records uh, in the name of third parties or companies which may be identified as entities in which Mr. Kenyatta has a significant interest and when that material is provided, we ask that the intelligence records be combed again for reference to those entities. It's a point your honours will have well in mind by now. Thank you. Mr. Attorney General. In our view, the certificate by the National Intelligence Service is conclusive of the matter. We would be willing to respond to a claim that a report other than what has been given is available somewhere else which we should investigate. Secondly, the request by OTP that uh, NSIS should be requested to give another report on uh, third parties, other corporate entities, not only is this an impossible one to comply with because the corporate entities are not identified and we have no way of knowing. I would imagine that if Mr. Kenyatta has 10 shares in Kenya Airways, the prosecutor would want a, a, a security intelligence report on the activities of Kenya Airways during that period. Uh, we, we would be happy to provide that if any of such is kept. But we would have to be told what are these corporate entities and who are these other persons. Is it his watchman? Is it his cook? Is it his gardener? The absurdity of this request must be clear to all that we are being asked without specificity, without sp any identification to do a general search about persons we do not know. 
we are unable to do that. And we regret that we are unable to do that because it is impractical, not because we are obstructing. Okay. Uh, Madam President, a corporation as a statutory body, I don't know whether the uh, National Intelligence uh, Agency was sitting in companies' house watching uh, the, the f files of, of shares or, or anything like that. This is a completely uh, badly drawn request of no relevance to the case for immaterial evidence that could never be fulfilled uh, and is plainly a fishing exercise. Uh, I ask the court to remember the very limited area of which the court was concerned when this case was adjourned and, and somehow this has been allowed to develop and mushroom and we're spending our time arguing matters but not the primary matters with which we were concerned on that day in January when the prosecution got their adjournment to avoid a disposal of the case in a trial by the entering of a not guilty verdict. Uh, and so requests like this have been made that are utterly fruitless for the case. And uh, whatever explanations are, are given, I can assure you we have found nothing uh, of relevance uh, within the evidence. Thank you, Mr. K. Mr. Gay, no? I simply want to observe, Madam President, that under the law of Kenya, the accused is in fact in direct control of the National Intelligence Service, which illustrates another of the unique difficulties of this case. He controls that service, so it perhaps should not be entirely surprising that we're not able to get anything, or the prosecution is not able to get anything useful from that service. Thank you. Must he be allowed to continue demonstrating his ignorance of Kenyan law? The National Intelligence Service is organized under an independent entity. If you may bother to look up the law. Mr. Attorney General, uh, please be reminded that if you want to uh, speak in this courtroom, please wait for me to call you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Well, um, as for the next steps and timeline, uh, part of which we have already discussed, it is clear from the discussion that there are still a number of outstanding issues. And uh, as I mentioned before, following the discussion this morning, in ex parte session, it was agreed that the chamber would receive written submissions on certain points of disagreement regarding the specificity and relevance of certain of the requests. Filing deadlines of uh, 11 July for the prosecution and 16 July for the Kenyan government had been agreed. However, um, given the uh, urgency and importance of this issue, because uh, judging from the submissions made in this session as well, um, those issues are common to almost all categories. And uh, given the prosecution submission that they intend largely to rest on their existing submissions and would be willing to make the requested filing as soon as required, the chamber would like to inquire whether it would be agreeable to 
move each of those deadlines forward by one day. Therefore, the prosecution would make its filing tomorrow, by the end of tomorrow, and the Kenyan government on 15th July. Would that be acceptable? Prosecution. Uh, Your Honour, there is no doubt that if I were the sole producer of such a document, uh, I could do it by four o'clock tomorrow evening, which is what you're asking for. Yeah. Regrettably, there are a number of procedures which require those above me, I'm trying not to sound too bureaucratic here, uh, to ensure that I haven't gone off my head and uh, uh, made submissions which are not to the point or in some way wholly inappropriate. Uh, realistically, having spoken to my colleague, Mr. Lowry, uh, who has a longer experience than I, uh, I think there would be a risk uh, that we wouldn't be able to comply with something which would require us to produce a fully checked and authorised document in 24 hours and 20 minutes. So uh, although I have urged that we move as quickly as we can, and, and I remain of that view, and indeed remain of the view that written submissions, in truth, uh, could be dispensed with, if they are required, and if they're required to be of the appropriate standard and to have gone through the appropriate hoops, uh, the original time period of 48 hours is one which I must ask for. Thank you very much. In that case, um, let's stick to the initial deadline of 11 July for the prosecution and 16th July for the uh, Kenyan government. Very well, Madam President. Thank you. And uh, the chamber also would like to reiterate that the cooperation and negotiations are to proceed in parallel and the fact the, and that the fact that submissions have been requested on this point should in no way suspend the ongoing execution of the request. That's the point I made uh, this morning, and I would like to stress the importance of this request uh, in this open session. Now, uh, prosecution and Kenyan government, uh, are there any other submissions that you'd like to make? And uh, after that, I'd like to give floor to defense and uh, legal representative to make any submissions. No, I think the Attorney General and I, from what I gather from his body language across the court, are, are in agreement. There's nothing further to be said on our part. Attorney General, no? Just to place on record uh, the, the, the our thanks for the cooperation we've received from the prosecutor on this matter. And indeed, I return that. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kay. Uh, thank you, Your Honour. Uh, can I remind the court uh, of what was said on the 5th of February um, 2014 uh, concerning the uh, request by the prosecution to have this trial uh, uh, adjourned. Uh, and that concerned that the last remaining, absent the financial records, the remaining stones unturned are better characterized as pebbles and the realistic prospect that turning them will yield really potentially conclusive evidence is minimal. And the prosecutor went on to say that uh, if records of the financial accounts of the accused uh, were produced, and if there were no such movements of funds, that will be a cardinal point to suggest his innocence. Uh, on the other hand, if there was unexplained movements of large amounts of money, that would tend to support the prosecution's assertions. Uh, those bank records have been obtained. Uh, they have been able to be analyzed uh, by today's date. 
the court knows exactly the allegations that have been made uh, in this case uh, and the amounts of money that were being posited as uh, being uh, payments for the post-election violence. Uh, I wonder if the prosecutor ha has explained to you that in every single one of those accounts that he will have looked at, there is actually not a single withdrawal uh, that supports uh, the allegations made in this case. <coughs> uh, but instead of, of just dealing with the stones uh, and pebbles, uh, we now seem to be dealing uh, with large earth-moving equipment uh, to try and find extra evidence or create a situation where requests are made that cause a further request to be made uh, that is incapable of fulfillment and any person considering, because the allegations in the case uh, would well have been understood uh, by the government of Kenya, uh, by the parties and by those watching, that the heads of request of tax returns and other information, when the accounts, not, not any returns or forms, but the actual accounts have been produced by the relevant uh, authority from the Kenyan banking system, utterly defeat the allegations made in this case. And what I am concerned with is that we have been going through this process when we have re reached a stage of there being no evidence and it seems that the court is unwilling to grab the issue and dismiss this case. Prosecution uh, don't want to withdraw it. They create obstacles saying it's the Kenyan government. That's the reason why they can't come to a decision. When they've had the means at their disposal since the 23rd of June to satisfy the statement that was made in this court on the 5th of February. Our concern is that the court and the pressure of this case, and I don't mean the judges, I mean the institution itself, having brought such a high-profile case against President Kenyatta, has now found itself with a big problem of credibility in relation to this prosecution, and we are being made the victims of the process. The answers to the evidence of the prosecutor and the case that he wanted to build are very apparent from the evidence that has been disclosed, be it phone records, vehicle records, financial records. Instead, requests far exceeding any notion of the evidence in this case are being made without any relevance to the allegations. Uh, and it's quite clear to many people, having listened to what these requests were today, that we are simply descending into a, a, a world of complete uh, lack of objectivity. Our position is that this case failed on the 5th of February. Time was given. Work has been done to try and enable the prosecutor to fulfill what he claimed he wanted to fulfill on the 5th of February. But what has happened is another game has started because they have had cold feet about the disposal of this case. 
Everybody knows the pressure around this building concerning this case, the things that were said about my client, the allegations and assertions made in this courtroom, the decisions made from the confirmation of charges hearing based upon evidence they produced, which then proved to be fabricated and false. This is a very unreal position that we are in at this stage if this court has not had a grip of this case to put this case... Uh, uh, Mr. K, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, please stick to the uh, uh, theme of this status conference, which is cooperation request. Yes, uh, and the cooperation requests are merely a frontispiece. They are nothing more than that. And we have had outstanding our request for a verdict of not guilty and a termination of these proceedings since the declaration by the prosecutor that their case lacked sufficient evidence. And at probably at a time and understanding, because it is very close in proximity, we get the rebirth of the requests to the government of Kenya in November uh, of last year. But we have outstanding this application for the termination of these proceedings, uh, and it is utterly wrong when the evidence that has been supplied comprehensively proves that. And if there had been any real need for inquiries to be made, they would have made those inquiries from the 23rd of June to satisfy themselves of the operations of these uh, accounts. And, and those are my, my submissions, that this court has the power. Uh, the, the, the game of disclosure and discovery and ex parte status conferences uh, to discuss matters sucks the court into a longer process. Mr. Kay, uh, may I remind that you don't need to argue the decisions already made by this chamber? Yes. I, I, I thank you, uh, uh, Your Honour. Um, but you can understand our frustration, I, I hope, and it's in, in our submission, it should be a fair trial consideration uh, that we have a right for the expeditious disposal of this case since the collapse of the confirmation of charges decision, the collapse of the document containing charges, and we have been waiting... And my client has a, a, func a, 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 a function and task on behalf of his people to fulfill. And this matter is left undetermined and hanging over his head when he has a clear business in ensuring the proper governance of Kenya. In fact, the expectations and rights of, of the victims would have been better served by a dispassionate investigation uh, in this case I instead of having their hopes raised uh, and a case that was built on unsolid foundations uh, inevitably collapsed, as we always said it would, uh, and we continue to say that. And, and those are my submissions at this stage urging this court to dispose of this matter. Thank you. Mr. Gaynor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, and uh, please stick to the agenda item of this status conference. I will indeed, Madam President. At the risk of sounding pessimistic, everything that we've heard today from the government of Kenya is indicative that we have had uh, no real change in what is essentially uh, a policy of obstruction of access to relevant documents and relevant witnesses. Now, I do want to express my concern that the prosecution is only proceeding on one specimen charge in under Article 87.7 of the statute. I've communicated with the prosecution that we believe it's imperative that they should file as many 87.7 requests to your honours as are necessary to reflect the totality of obstruction by the government in this case. In my submission, the prosecution has been very lax with the government of Kenya. Its first uh, 87.7 request came in December 2013. 
By then, the cases against Mr. Ali and Mr. Muthara had already collapsed. Uh, according to the prosecution's own submissions, both cases had suffered from evidentiary weaknesses, which can be directly linked to the state's failure to provide proper access to relevant witnesses and relevant documents. Now, it is imperative that should, in due course, the trial chamber refer this matter to the Assembly of States parties for their further action. The Assembly of States parties must have a full picture of the entirety of what's going on in this case. And the question of obstruction of access to evidence, let's leave that to one side. But let's not forget that the government has opposed the compulsory of testimony of witnesses in Kenya. It has opposed rule changes intended to facilitate the admission of the evidence of witnesses who have been bribed, intimidated, or who have disappeared. It has promoted the view that the ICC is racist and neo-colonialist. It has put forth arguments repeated today that the consent of the suspect is required before incriminatory evidence can be delivered to the prosecution. It has failed to keep its numerous promises to this court, to the UN, and to the ASP to ensure a genuine domestic justice process for PEV crimes. Not one police officer, not one rapist, has been convicted in Kenya for crimes committed during the post-election violence period. There is, in fact, a status of total impunity in Kenya for those who directed PEV crimes at the local, national, and regional level. Now, the Attorney General have previously argued, uh, I don't want to misquote him, but I think he's essentially taking the position that Mr. Kenyatta has no power to order the provision of evidence to the ICC. But a striking demonstration of Mr. Kenyatta's power and willingness to order the provision of documents is revealed in his decision last month to provide documents sought by Swiss prosecutors investigating financial crimes allegedly committed by Kenyan citizens around 15 years ago. Those victims who might have followed this in the newspapers in Kenya or on television are entitled to ask why Mr. Kenyatta will not also order the provision of relevant evidence to the ICC. A few facts will serve to illustrate the point. The Swiss Attorney General issued a press release on the 20th of June of this year confirming his request for documents to the government of Kenya. Within four days, it appears from articles published in the Star, both Mr. Kenyatta and the Attorney General had met the Swiss ambassador in Nairobi, assured him of their full support, and the requested documents had been handed over. An editorial in the Star, for what it's worth, suggests that Mr. Kenyatta gave his civil servants 24 hours to hand over the documents sought by the Swiss prosecutors. Now, we have links to these, uh, to these articles, which I'll circulate uh, to your honours and to the parties after this. The Swiss ambassador in Kenya personally said on television, I'll circulate a, a link to the, to the video, that, quote, the level of cooperation we have had with the Kenyan government is impressive. He went on to say, you can feel that there is political will to solve this. And we feel that the president is really serious about finally giving this kind of justice. So it's very good news. Well, that is good news. But it would be even better news if the president was really serious about finally giving this kind of justice to the victims of the post-election violence and giving the same kind of assistance to the ICC as they gave to the Swiss prosecutors in that affair known as the Anglo-Leasing Affair. Now, assistance provided by Kenya to other states is governed by the Mutual Legal Assistance Act of 2011. The Attorney General is the designated central authority under the Act. His role in that Act is similar but not identical to his role in the International Crimes Act, which of course governs assist assistance to your honours. And under Article 132 of the Constitution, the President shall ensure that the international obligations of the Republic are fulfilled through the actions of the relevant Cabinet Secretaries. So it should come as no surprise 
that when Mr. Kenyatta, as president of Kenya, wanted the Swiss prosecutors to get access to the material relevant to their investigation, the Attorney General very promptly provided access. The entire episode undermines the Attorney General's arguments concerning the distance of the President from the issue of ICC cooperation. It shows that Mr. Kenyatta ultimately controls the provision of evidence to prosecutors outside Kenya. It shows that the Attorney General will hand over relevant evidence when Mr. Kenyatta instructs him to do so. It shows, in summary, that where there is political will, evidence requested by outside prosecutors relating to criminal investigations of Kenyan citizens can be very swiftly identified and provided. Your Honours, in May and June of uh, 2014, I held 10 days of meetings with 401 victims of the crimes charged in this case in Western Kenya and near Nakuru. Now, in every one of those meetings, the reaction was largely the same. The victims feel angry, frustrated and betrayed and, frankly, Your Honours, deeply unimpressed with the performance of the prosecutor and the court in general. A very large part of that comes down in my submission to the slowness of the proceedings, which is ultimately the fault of the government of Kenya for obstructing the access in its, uh, of the prosecutor to relevant evidence. Your Honours, I wish to turn briefly to the question of trial without undue delay, which I believe is connected to it, it, it was raised at paragraph 80 of your decision of the 31st of March, 2014. Now, Mr. Gaynor, uh, you have two more minutes, Very but well. no more. I simply want to say that jurisprudence from Canada and elsewhere recognises that conduct which amounts to a knowing waiver of the right to an expeditious trial, as well as dilatory procedural tactics that might not amount to a knowing waiver, are relevant factors in determining whether delay has been reasonable. Mr. Kenyatta, by presiding over a government which obstructs the justice process, in this case in violation of Part 9 of the statute, has knowingly waived his right to an expeditious trial, and Your Honours might wish to invite submissions on that in due course. Now, Your Honours, it is absolutely imperative that you remain determined and unwavering in your dealings with the government of Kenya. I request you to do all you can do using the extensive powers conferred upon you by the state's parties to ensure Kenya's full compliance with its obligations under Part 9. If, having done so, Kenya re remains unwilling and you make a finding of non-cooperation, let that be. The court can then provide the Assembly of State's parties with a full and honest account of the totality of the government's campaign of non-cooperation and then the states' parties and other states who have expressed strong support, such as the United States at the United, State, at the United Nations Supreme Council, for the ICC's work in Kenya, they can have a firm and informed basis for taking such steps as they deem appropriate in respect of the deliberate obstruction of justice by Mr. Kenyatta and this government. Your Honours, at this pivotal moment in history, it is no exaggeration to say that you can help to break the cycle of impunity for political leaders which has existed in Kenya since before independence. And I request you to remain firm and unwavering in your commitment to do justice for the victims in this case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gaynor. Thank you very much. Um, I, I apologise, Madam President. There's one matter. It's over the filings. Yes. Uh, did you want Mr. Kay? the defence to uh, make a filing as well? It wasn't uh, clear to me. It may be something that the court um, uh, would appreciate on the basis that the facts are, are something that, that, that we do uh, have information about, unlike... Uh, the government of Kenya. I, I don't know whether...
Mr. K, um, because of the, due to the nature of the uh, contest and due to the nature of uh, cooperation, I don't think uh, the chamber needs the filings from submissions from defense or legal representative. Very well, Your Honor, thank you. Sorry thank for you. raising it. No. And this uh, brings us to the end of the matters to be discussed today. The chamber has well noted the submissions made by not only prosecution and government of Kenya, but also defense and legal representative. We thank very much the partisan participants and of course the uh, Mr. Attorney General for your contribution. And as usual, I would also thank uh, the court officers, interpreters, court reporters, and all other courtroom staff for their assistance. This status conference is now closed and the court will rise. Thank you. All rise. We will be